Welcome. I'm Lee Cowan, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. On this special edition, we feature interviews and exclusive excerpts from our sit-downs with three business leaders. We begin with Tim Cook. Tim Cook has been at the helm of Apple for more than a decade now. He accepted the CEO role as Steve Jobs' health was starting to fail. And since then, he has certainly made it his own. He's outspoken on social issues. He's confident about the company's foray into virtual reality. And he's now determined to make the iPhone carbon neutral. Our John Dickerson had a rare, wide-ranging conversation with this otherwise intensely private man who considers himself to be just an ordinary person. This four mile long stretch of solar panels, nearly a million of them, will look to some like a bold step towards a clean energy future. And to others, it will look like marketing disguised as social conscience, what cynics would call virtue signaling. I don't do virtue signaling at all. I don't believe in it. We want to do hard work. What Apple CEO Tim Cook means by hard work is making sure environmental choices make business sense. I want to see that it pencils out because I want other people to copy it, and I know they're not going to copy a decision that's not a good economic decision. In Brown County, Texas, flat, dry, near the geographical center of the state, Apple has invested in a joint venture to power 100,000 homes with clean energy. Where do you have these different investments towards your clean energy goals? We have them from Oregon to California. We have them in China. We have solar on rooftops in Singapore. Cook wants to match every bit of carbon released by Apple products with clean energy and carbon capture, what's called carbon neutral, from mining to manufacturing, shipping, even recycling. He has pledged to get there in just seven years and hopes Apple's lead will inspire others to follow. It can be done, and it can be done in a way that others can replicate, which is very important for us. We want to be the ripple in the pond. We want people to look at this and say, I can do that too, or I can do half of that. We want people to look at this and rip it off. Apple announced its first totally carbon neutral product, its new Apple Watch. Apple sold about 50 million watches last year, compared to more than 200 million iPhones. A carbon-neutral iPhone is the company's holy grail. And according to Christina Raspi, who manages Apple projects like this one, getting to carbon-neutral includes Apple's customers as well. Right now, we're focused across the company, and my department in particular, on ensuring every device that our customers own and operate, the electricity they use to charge it is offset by renewable energy. This is all about putting one watt in the system for every watt that our customers use to power our devices. Have you had to become an energy engineer in this process? <laughs> I don't know that I would uh, give myself that kind of certification, <laughs> but I certainly understand a lot more than I used to. You like everything so far? Cook was appointed Apple CEO by founder Steve Jobs in 2011, just months before Jobs lost his battle with cancer. Since then, Apple has become the most valuable company on the planet, worth nearly $3 trillion, nine times its value back when Cook became the boss. When you look at the time you've been CEO, are you more bold or more cautious? I came into the CEO role at a time that I was, along with the company, was in deep despair over Steve's health. And so that was a very difficult time to get over personally. And over time, you gain more confidence. And you have a feel for things. You know it when you see it, and you take more risk. We do have one more thing. One big risk Cook has taken is entering the virtual reality competition, where other companies have faltered. The Apple Vision Pro, there have been some reports that 
the suppliers are having trouble keeping up with the ambition of the project. Is it still on track for its release early 2024? It is on track. I'm using it on a regular basis. How do you use it? I watched the entire third season of, of Ted Lasso on the Vision Pro. And of course, there's some things that I have access to that other people don't have access to. And like so what I'm would doing those things that, be, that Tim? That I can't talk to you yeah. about. They come and act it out in front of you, right? Ted Lasso <laughs> and his crew. Has it been more complicated? Have they, are the puzzles that, that you've faced with creating it the same kinds you would face with an iPhone? No, it's, it's uh, more complex. And so it requires innovation in not only the development, but also in the manufacturing. But is it on track? It's on track. It is. It is on track. Success has also emboldened Cook to speak out on civil and voting rights issues, especially LGBTQ equality. Look this way, Tim. In Apple's Austin, Texas campus, the staff's diversity was clear to see. I was hoping you had a moment to chat with a very special guest. Hi. He even took a sales call. You want a larger display. I'll leave you with a professional now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been wonderful talking with you. Good, how are you? No. <laughs> You guys thought I'd screw it off. <laughs> the caller wanted to upgrade their iPhone. Did you tell her to hold out for the 15? <laughs> I didn't exactly <laughs> say that. You said, I don't, I don't think of myself as a celebrity. No, I don't. But you are. I'm, I'm just a fairly ordinary person, and people love the company. And, and so they express that love with me a lot. Thank you. Thank you. This may be a welcoming place for Apple's 10,000 Austin employees, but while Texas promotes its business-friendly climate, the state has pursued strong anti-abortion and anti-trans and gay legislation. When we last talked, you said, I believe that everyone should be treated with dignity and respect and that all roads lead to equality. How should people think about your commitment to equality and the politics of Texas, which would seem to be clashing with that? There will always be cases, John, where we're either selling or operating in a place where we have a difference of opinion on something. But I'm telling you from, from our heart, we believe in treating everyone with dignity and respect. And that's how we show up as a company. We believe in being a part of the community and trying to advocate for change rather than pulling the moat up and going away. We at the ADL are all grateful for your leadership. That worldview won Cook the Anti-Defamation League's Courage Against Hate Award in 2018. Today, the ADL has accused tech mogul Elon Musk of promoting anti-Semitism on his platform X, formerly known as Twitter, a charge Musk denies. Should Apple continue to advertise on Twitter? It's something that we ask ourselves. Generally, my view is Twitter's an important property. I like the concept that it's there for discourse and there is a town square. There's also some things about it I don't like. There's discourse, and then there's anti-Semitism. And yeah, that which, bright line um, is... Uh, it's abhorrent, just point blank. The, there is no place for it. So is this something you're constantly evaluating, or...? It's something we constantly ask ourselves. When we last talked to Cook, it was by remote, in the thick of the pandemic. Like every big company in America, Apple is at a crossroads with how to return to the office. How have you approached the coming back to work part of the post-pandemic age? Yeah, what we did was we, we admitted we don't know what the best approach is. And so what we decided to do was run a pilot where people would come into the office three days a week. We deal with user experience, and this requires collaboration and so we knew it had to have a fair amount of in-person work. And we're still in a pilot today. During the pandemic, a lot of people had um, uncertainty about what gives them meaning in life. Mm -hmm. And they reevaluated their work choices. And that's part of what this come back to work is about. It's balancing what gives you meaning and, and work may not do that. What gives you meaning in the work you do? Our work 
is meant to improve other people's lives. What really turns us on and gets us excited is seeing what people do with our products, where people are doing things and we're empowering them to do it through our products. And as long as you know, we get that energy, it's a virtuous cycle. We want to do more, we want to release the next product and the next product. It's a renewable energy resource. Yeah, there you go. And now, here's an exclusive extended interview from John Dickerson and Tim Cook. Something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. What more does Apple have to do to reach the goals you want for it to be in terms of being carbon neutral? Well, this is our first product that's carbon neutral. You know, I'm, I'm wearing it right now. I'm so excited about it. We've got more products to go. And so by 2030, what our objective is, is to have everything that Apple ships to be carbon neutral. Let me define what that means for a minute. That means not only our offices are carbon neutral, which are, are today, but it also means the supply chain is in total. And importantly, the energy required to recharge your devices uh, in your homes and on people's offices, that is also uh, offset by the renewable energy that you saw today with the solar farm. What's the hardest nut to crack in that ambitious goal? The scale of what we do is very large. And, and so it's the totality of it and working through all of the countries around the world uh, because we want this not only for our home country but we want to do it globally and so just the sheer scale is significant also we're trying to do it in a way that is economically good and the reason for that is other than we're a business is because we want people to copy us right. We want people to look at it and say, I see myself in that. I, we want to be the ripple in the pond. And so we, take, we may take a little longer to get to a solution that someone else can copy. And of course, we're working with many suppliers around the world uh, that we need to convert their operations to renewable energy. Is a carbon neutral iPhone the, the holy grail? It's, it's a stretch, but by 2030, we'll have a carbon neutral iPhone. And the toughest part of getting that is what, your suppliers? Getting them to be carbon neutral? It's, it's a combination of the suppliers and things like in the transportation world, we've taken our transportation carbon emissions down significantly by converting from air to sea, while at the same time we're shrinking our packaging, doing away with plastics, and being able to put more products on a, on a pallet, so you're able to ship a lot more in the same kind of space as before. But the airline piece of that is difficult. Sustainable air aviation fuel is a, is, it still needs more discovery, right. more work to make it economically viable. And there are networks that people talk about from time to time as being possibly purchased by companies. Is Apple in the market? Uh, no, we're not. We're not actively looking at someone right now. Are um, they knocking on your door? Nobody's knocked in the in the recent in the in the recent period. But you know, we're always scanning the market mm -hmm. and thinking. But we like to do things organically for the most part. Yeah. That doesn't mean that we rule out acquisition. And so it's a little different yeah. way of looking at it. We try to do something that helps us accelerate. Uh, a feature or accelerate us into a, to a certain uh, business or area. And again, that doesn't mean that we would never do it, but, but it, would, it would be a high bar. Given the amount of cash that Apple has and mm -hmm. the skill and proven success over time, how much is restraint a part of what you and your team does? In other words, staying in your lane. Mm -hmm. How much of a challenge is that? Or is it not a challenge at all because you know you know what your lane is and you just stay in it. Well, we believe in focus. And so we, we think that we can only do a few things well, and we really believe this. And so we will debate and argue and, and discuss and go back and forth on entering a new area to make sure that it's something that we can do at a quality level, at a deep level, uh, and really contribute how soon do you think we'll be doing this interview with those headsets on? 
Maybe early next year. <laughs> you might assume that becoming America's first black female billionaire was fraught with obstacles. And it was. Sheila Johnson gives a step-by-step -step account of her path to success in her memoir, Walk Through Fire. Nancy Giles caught up with her at the serene slice of heaven she calls home. Just outside of our nation's capital, amid Virginia's rolling hills and picturesque stone walls, is a place that time seems to have forgotten. And I'll tell you, in the fall when the trees turn, it's just spectacular. I bet. Yeah. Oh my God. The place Sheila Johnson calls home. When you first came out here, what did you think? This is where I needed to live. It feels like a sanctuary. Yes. Yeah. It is. She came here in 1996 to find refuge. At the time, BET, Black Entertainment Television, the company she and Robert L. Johnson had co-founded, was hugely successful. But their struggling marriage was the talk of the town. The rumor mill was off the chart. People would tell me. I saw them at the Super Bowl. Oh, I saw her come down in his shirt. And I said, I need a place where I can be alone at peace. Right. Oh. And this is my secret garden. And you come out there in the mornings? That's where I have my coffee, yes. Yeah. Today, Sheila like Johnson that. is a very yeah. successful businesswoman and part owner of three sports teams. On wow. this wall are the championship <gasps> mystics. And you look like you've been crying. I have been. <laughs> The first black woman to make it into the very exclusive, very white, and very male billionaires club. And yet, she says, tongues are still wagging. You know, they look at me and they go, okay, you were so-called the first black billionaire and everything, and you've had it so easy. Oh. No, I haven't. Do people and to, say that? You've had it so easy? You have no idea. There's so many stories out there. They need to hear from me. Her book, Walk Through Fire, published by our sister company, Simon & Schuster, takes its title from the legend of the salamander. It's the only animal mythically that walks through fire and still comes out alive. It's also the name of her impressive collection of five-star luxury resorts. Hi, how are you? We joined Sheila Johnson as she welcomed guests to her flagship salamander resort and spa in Middleburg, Virginia for a weekend of good food and wisdom from some of the country's top chefs. This has been a marriage in culinary heaven. It's been 10 years since the doors first opened. It was not an easy road. Oh, no. In some ways, the town of Middleburg had welcomed her. But the thing that really bothered me was driving into town every day and seeing a Confederate flag in a gun shop. When I saw that flag, I said, God, where did I move to? Mm -hmm. You know, and I just decided to buy the building. And it's now a wonderful market. That's the beauty of having a little money. Getting the town's approval to build a resort was another matter. I thought I had left one fire. I jumped into a great big one. And I forgot I was south of the Mason-Dixon line. They came after me with all barrels. And uh, they signed petitions. We had hearings. I won by one vote. One thing to know about Sheila Johnson, giving up is not in her DNA. Your mom walked through fire in oh many ways. Oh my goodness. Her life, you know, had a huge impact on me. Here she was at the top of the social circle as a woman, as a mother married to a doctor. Theirs was an African-American success story, though that success was hard won. By the time she was 10, Sheila Crump had moved 13 times. We moved about every 10 months. Right, because of the work situations for your yeah, father, Yeah, because my right? father couldn't practice in white hospitals, um, and he couldn't even operate on white patients. Finally, her father got a permanent job in Chicago, and they were able to buy a house and settle down. She took up the violin and excelled at it. And then, without warning, her father announced he was leaving the family. It brought us all to our knees because it was just one night, and he says, I'm leaving. Her mother had a breakdown. She had always been my backbone, and I was losing her. It just really kind of destroyed me in a way. And then I realized, I said, Sheila, you know, you can't play the victim here. With the help of her violin teacher, she got a music scholarship to the University of Illinois, 
where she met an upperclassman named Bob Johnson. You were pretty young. Really young. Yeah. How about 16 and a half? What was your first impression of him? I was always looking for someone with ambition, but I was also going through something else psychologically because my father had left. I felt unloved. He wanted me. And because of him wanting me, I wanted him. Their marriage lasted for 33 years. I shouldn't have, I really shouldn't have let it go on as long as I did. I didn't want to be a failure. And I kept saying, I can, I can get through this. Mm -hmm. And I was really behind him. So much so that I got erased out of the picture. Their divorce was finalized in 2002. By coincidence or fate, the end of that chapter was the beginning of another. As I walked into the courtroom, I looked at the judge and I looked at my lawyer. I said, I think I know this guy. The guy was Judge William T. Newman, Jr. Many, many years ago, we um, happened to be in a play together. And <laughs> when the case was over, she said, excuse me, Your Honor, can I approach the bench? And I said, sure. I said, do you remember me? He goes, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> she invited him to a gala she was hosting. And I put on the invitation, William T. Newman, Jr., and guest. Bill told his mother about it. I said, well, I guess I'll take so-and-so, who I just started to date. You were actually going to take someone else? Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> and my mother said, oh, no, you go to that party alone. Three years later, they married a lavish wedding that was the social event of the season. And I said, I love this man so much, we are going to celebrate. We had 750 people at that wedding. It was, I have to say, the most beautiful wedding. It's a nursery. It is. These days, Sheila Johnson is looking forward, not back. And she has no intention of slowing down. I've come to reconcile the fact that we do need to walk through fire in order to come out stronger at the other end. Here's an exclusive excerpt from Nancy Giles and Sheila Johnson. You played violin. Yes. I played viola, by the way. All right. What made you choose the violin? I don't know, <laughs> but I just love the feel of the instrument. I love the way it sounded. And I don't know why, but all my life, I, I send the pick up the most difficult things to do. And so I started with the violin mm -hmm. and I just fell in love with it. And from that point on, you know, I, to this day, I still play. Oh, I so play glad. the cello. I took up cello during COVID. I just love music. Absolutely love music. It does, it enhances your life in so many ways. And, it really and does. All the qualities that you mentioned are things that you also continue to bring to the table. But you know what else? The violin also gave me a safety net during the time that my life was in a dark moment. You know, I would go to my violin, it would calm me down, it would make me feel better. Mm -hmm. It became my best friend, if mm -hmm. you want to know the truth. And I just love listening to the music. I remember my mother buying me a phonograph with all of the classical music, and I think to this day I have it somewhere stored. Oh. But with just, you know, the record she put the needle on. Records. And, yes, albums. the records, the yeah. albums, and I would just play them even when I was, you know, doing my homework. And I would go to the symphony, down the Chicago Symphony, and listen to the symphony there. And I just love music. And again, classical music and African Americans, it, it's not a mix you always no. hear. Except there was always classical music and Motown music. You know, it, was, exactly. it really was there. So that was kind of a sort of a traditionally white space, I'd say, that you were really it integrating was, on your but own. But I did listen to Motown. I listened to all, I could sing every record to you. I mean, I loved it. You know, I wanted to party too a little bit. <laughs> but I have to say that I just love music in general. Yes. I even love jazz. I remember going into college and just listening to Miles Davis. Mm. Sketches of Spain, mm -hmm. you know. It's all part of a piece. It's all part of it. And I just love music. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you had an incident that happened with another violinist that really hit me where yes. she's, t you want to tell what happened? Yes. I mean, for the past three years, I was always trying out for Illinois Allstate. And mm -hmm. I would get like fourth chair or third chair or something like that. And then that's my senior year. 
I actually captured the concert mistress spot. Right. And I was always competing against this one person. And she says, you only got it because you're, and she said the N-word. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. And I said, you know what? I just grip my teeth and I'm like, you're just going to have to deal with it. You've had you to know? deal with those things in, in many different ways. And you've done it with such grace and even humor. You have to, because if you stoop to their level, they come back at you. And I always want to be above board. Mm, mm. And I, one thing I've learned, when people say ugly, nasty things to you, you just look at them and you be quiet. You just stare. Wow. It throws them completely off guard. If you saw pictures of my father, he's very fair. Mm. The people would second guess, but you know. He could almost pass for white, but not quite. Yes. There was enough doubt. And believe it or not, that is still my world mm. to this day. And then as I've later learned that even in all cultures, you know, the fairer skins, it's, a, it's an issue. And even going into the media business, yep. it was always the fairer women got to be on camera. Right. The darker women were behind, behind the, the camera. camera. So this is a theme. I, I do continue to watch it. You know, I watch it even in my hospitality industry. I make sure that I want people of color at the front desk. I want them to visit my hotels. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that people know I'm all about diversity and about everyone. Walking through fire, all the women who walk through fire. It, is this book specifically for women or for everyone who might it's, have gone through that? This book is really for everyone. I want the women to start looking at themselves. I want them to realize their own power. For men, I want more respect looking at these women and giving them the room to grow. There's so many men that want to be controlling. Mm. They want their women to be submissive. And that turns me off more than anything. I mean, I just think it's crippling. It's crippling for many women. And I just think when you marry someone on both sides, give each other room to grow and to be the better part of themselves because that's what makes a really strong marriage. Entrepreneur Mark Cuban has been hustling for nearly 50 years. But as he told Jim Axelrod, what matters most to him now is making an impact, not making money. Is it impossible to stay connected to what most people would think of as a normal life? Yes and no. I mean, Always looking to unlock hidden value. It's not like my friends are rich, they're not. Multi-billionaire Mark Cuban. At the same time, if you're jumping on a plane and it's your plane. Apparently finds none in either shy or retiring. The owner of the NBA's Dallas Mavericks, whose unrestrained dress downs of league refs have cost him millions in fines. Obviously, I'm incredibly impressed. A panelist on Shark Tank for the last 13 years. Rule number one, I'll teach you, don't overnegotiate. 550 for 11%. Done. Done. You got a deal. Five million dollars to build his factory. The kind of guy who loved playing himself on HBO's Entourage. You know what's going to happen? Mark's going to make Gordon Gecko look like Mary Poppins. I will never forget this. Cuban. Neither will I, Turtle. Is one high-functioning multitasker. <laughs> but these days, if you want to know what's grabbing his attention. As big a potential disruptor as this space has seen. That's the goal. Check out his venture, Mark Cuban's Cost Plus Drugs, that aims to change the way we fill our prescriptions. How much of your head is Cost Plus eating up right now? About 99.99%. Financial, emotional, intellectual, all that bandwidth is going to Cost Plus. Prescription drugs are a half a trillion dollar market in the U.S., Cuban wants more transparency into how prices are set, an opaque and complicated process, he says, that's largely controlled by middlemen. Cost Plus deals directly with manufacturers and consumers, offering more profits for those who make drugs and lower prices for those who take them. Let me make sure I understand this. Uh -huh. Cost? You see it. Plus 15% for yep. you. Plus $3 pharmacy fee because the pharmacist needs to get paid, and then $5 shipping if it's mail order. Simple. Simple. Cost Plus Drugs offers 1,100 medications right now, mostly, but not all generics, like atorvastatin, the generic of the cholesterol drug Lipitor. Retail, 5508 for 30 pills. Cost Plus, 
$3.60 for the same amount. When I was in my 20s and my 30s and my early 40s, it was all about how much money could I make. But at this point in my life where the next dollar that I bring in isn't going to change my life, my kids' life, their kids' lives, the capitalistic reward comes from having an impact. At the age of 64, Mark Cuban's been focused on the next dollar for close to 50 years, since he was a kid in Pittsburgh. Selling garbage bags door to door, selling magazines, selling candy door to door. You did all that? All that. Hi, my name is Mark. Do you use garbage bags? If you just call me every time you need garbage bags, they're only $6 per hundred. I'll come and I'll just drop them off at the house. Once you're a salesperson and you know how to sell, there's nothing you can't do. That salesmanship developed alongside a certain toughness in his working class Jewish home. The first time I ever got into a fight, some kid walked up and just punched me and started calling me a kike. And of course I had to beat the hell out of him, but I go into my dad and saying, What's a kike? Every generation has a reason to have fear, but every generation has a reason to have hope. He took those qualities with him to Indiana University, along with a penchant for risk-taking and thinking outside the box. Did you buy a bar before you were old enough to drink? Yes, Motley's Pub. And that was the first time I had to try to get things organized and actually run a real business. And I realized I wasn't that good at it. There were a lot of mistakes that I made. After graduation, he worked at a bank. That lasted nine months. Cuban had too many other things to try. Watch your hand. One last push here. Like acting, grabbing parts in a bunch of B movies. Who's Rachel? His first big money came at the age of 30, selling a software company he built called Microsolutions. While still not ready to settle down, I netted about $2 million after taxes. I bought a lifetime pass on American Airlines, and I'm not going to work. I'm just going to party like a rock star in as many countries as I can. His ever-churning mind was focused on and investing in the emerging sector of technology and computers. My net worth just kept on going bam, 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 along with that. By the time I'm um, 35, I was worth, you know, 15, 20 million dollars. Life was good. Millions became billions when he and his college buddy, Todd Wagner, also now living in Dallas, wanted to listen to Indiana University basketball games on their old campus 900 miles away. So I go buy a computer, upgrade my phone line, downloaded Netscape software for a server, and started looking at different alternatives to try to put audio and eventually video on the internet. Nobody was doing it at the time. We were the first. I feel like I'm listening to the origin story of streaming. It is the origin story of streaming. There was nobody doing it, nobody. People thought I was an idiot. He wasn't. You sell to Yahoo? Sell to Yahoo for $5.7 billion in stock. It was the craziest thing ever. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I could be worth a billion. I was ready to retire when I had two million, <laughs> you know? If you were worth a tenth of what you're yeah. worth, you would be just as happy. Yeah, of course. One percent of what you're worth. Yes. If I have my same family and everything, for sure. And the people who say that's easy for him to say? Yeah, of course. But if you talk to my friends from back then who are still my friends, they'll tell you I've got stuff. But hopefully I haven't changed all that much. We took him up on his idea to talk to his oldest pals. The big man, Bofi, Toda Pro, and Stu. Getting them together at a lunch spot in Pittsburgh. He said, if you ask the guys I grew up with, I am the same guy. Different stuff, same guy. Absolutely. Yeah, I think so. A little more full of it, but not, not that much more full of it. But still the same guy. A little bit. Same guy, meaning what the world sees of Mark Cuban now, they saw first, then. We got into stamps. I'd like to collect stamps, and Mark expressed an interest in stamps with the stamp show. We need to go in with $20. I come out with some stamps, and Mark would come out with $100. <laughs> <laughs> that, I mean, that, it's amazing. It's like, how did you do that? Inefficient markets. You look for inefficient markets. Yeah. He's buy them on the second floor and sell them on the first floor, right? Basically. Pretty much, yeah. Which is how he got to shooting baskets. That's all we need. We're done. <laughs> on a full court in the backyard of his $20 million plus mansion. It's two for two for anybody scoring at Yeah, home. we'll stop right there. Where he lives with his wife and three kids. My son gives me a hard time if I'm missing. I'm like, come on, Mark. A guy who's been draining him from deep for decades now. What did you know about running a professional sports team when you bought the maps? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The Dallas Mavericks he paid $285 million for 23 years ago 
are now estimated to be worth more than $3 billion. But remember, this is a guy looking for hidden value. The connection to your customer is stronger than anywhere else. You don't get requests from Make-A-Wish to sit down with a software programmer. A That's man who understands not... the role of good fortune in creating his great one. Do you walk around every day feeling like, man, did I get a good deal of the cards? Yeah. How does this happen to me? How do you explain it? I can't. Life is half random. There's half you have some level of control over and half it is what it is. If I was born five years sooner, not during you know the early days of the internet, you might not know my name. And I'm gonna never take it for granted and enjoy every stinking moment of it. Again, an extended talk between Jim Axelrod and Mark Cuban, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. I was talking to somebody who knew you a gazillion years ago and said, Mark loves having vision but what he likes even more is selling that vision. Yeah. Accurate? Sure. Yeah, it, 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 that's a great description. I hadn't really thought of that before. Um, yeah, it's fun. Steve Jobs said everything's a remix. And, you know, learning technology, learning an industry is kind of like a ball of thread. It's hard when you first get started, but once you get some foundation, just, you know, putting more and more thread around, it just makes the ball of knowledge even bigger. And once I get there and think I can have an impact, that's when it's fun to sell. Again, like cost plus drugs or changing the Mavericks or, you know, any industry, HDNet, whatever it was, um, just going out there and saying, look, here's my vision. Am I right or wrong? You know, is this going to work in, in the marketplace or not? And that's, that's exciting to me. That, that's a challenge. That's the competitive side of me who says, OK, let's go out there and compete. Was your vision sort of something that was God given or did you work at refining your sense of the worlds that interested you to the point where you knew a little bit more, a step ahead of everybody else. I was just obscenely curious about everything. Going to my grandparents' house, there's no drawer I wouldn't open to see what was behind there. You know, I wanted to read the encyclopedia, <laughs> you know, just to see what I could learn. I've always had a really strong sense of curiosity to this day, and I just want to keep on learning. And I learned when I combined that knowledge with sales ability, anything is possible. Uh Knowledge, sales ability, there's one more piece of the puzzle, it seems to me, which is a bit of nerve, that a bit of ability to take risk and not be intimidated by what happens if I fail. Yeah. In other words, you had this knowledge, but unless, some people are curious, really curious, but they then don't apply that curiosity out in the world because they're scared. Yeah. So was that also something that just, I think it's the competitive side of me. I mean, I was never great at sports, but I was good enough to compete. And, um, you know, you walk onto a court and you play the game and, and you see what happens and business is the exact same thing. No politics. Mark Cuban never runs for president? Never. Never. I can have more of an impact now. For all the reasons why I couldn't work at Mellon Bank and I fight the NBA officials, you know, could you imagine being in a in a political environment where there's a very specific set of rules that you always have to follow. I mean, I think there's things I could do better, but every entrepreneur thinks that about politics, you know? Um, but yeah, you won't see me run. I think I have more, more of an impact with cost plus drugs, and if that blows up to where we think it can be, wherever I can extend that. I read a really interesting quote from you. If I can come up with solutions that people can truly get behind and truly solve problems, then it makes perfect sense for me to run. If it comes down to do I think I can win because I can convince more people to vote for me, then no, yeah. I won't run. Yeah, I mean, you actually could probably do the sale. Yeah, I could do the sale, but I just, you know, prior to cost plus drugs, maybe the calculus would have been different, but now I see the impact. What, what happens? Very few people will have this experience in their life. When you begin to integrate into your reality that you're worth a billion dollars, yeah. what happens? Surreal. What's that process like? For me, anyways, it was surreal. You know, to this minute, to this very second, it's surreal. It's not real life in, in so many respects. But at that time, it wasn't so much me. It wasn't like, the only thing I really wanted to go out and buy was an airplane because the point my dad always made to me was, you know, you can't get your time back. Today's the youngest you're ever going to be. You're, mm -hmm. You gotta live like it. And it won't resonate when you're 40, it'll resonate when you're 60 and 70, and, and it has. And 
buying an airplane so I could recapture time, that, that was my one guilty pleasure. Um, but everything else, I mean, look at me. <laughs> I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.